Andy, thank you so much. And I remember our many breakfasts and uh, it, it's a joy to be back here again. For those of you who I haven't had the privilege of meeting, uh, it's it's really nice to see half of your faces and I hope that in the future I'll, I'll be able to see the, the totality of it. Um, but it really is a joy to be here to worship with you all. And I'm so thankful to see how God continues to use his church through whatever season he and his wisdom places us in. And in every season we have the opportunity to proclaim him to exalt him as we depend on him and live by his grace and for his glory uh, i understand that this for 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 you guys you've been through a season where you're considering what it means to understand the leadership in the church we've considered what god's word says about those who serve him and in some ways that includes all of us we understand as those that have changed hearts we now live for the sake of our lord and master as his servants whatever role you have however god has gifted you and God has also outlined in his word that there are some who are deacons, who are elders, but we are all a part of the body of Christ. Today, I wanted to consider together with you all the motivation of ministry and leadership. The motivation of ministry and leadership. What is it that causes us to continue to do what we do, even when we face difficulties, trials, and challenges? How is it that when we're tired and exhausted that we can continue to live not for ourselves, but for, for God instead? And what drives me to wake up, to, to, to even to come to, to serve in church, to preach on Sunday mornings instead of sleeping in, is simply the glory of God. The glory of God. Today we'll be looking at Psalm 24. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn together to, to Psalm 24. I'm a little shorter, so I have to adjust the microphone. <laughs> and I'll be reading out loud if you could join and read along with me. Uh, not out loud, but in your heads. Psalm 24, David writes, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is a generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The, law, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come to worship you through the fellowship of your church, through singing, through the preaching and listening to of your word, we rejoice that even as we do so as imperfect vessels, as those who are inadequate and unworthy, we come not because we are worthy, but because you are. We praise you that even as we've sinned against you and are deserving of the punishment of death and wrath and hell, that you've sent your son to live the life that we can never live, to die the death that we deserve to die, to rise and to, to rule as king. And we anticipate the return of our great and glorious king. So God, would you be with us? Uh, help me to preach your word faithfully. And Holy Spirit, would you take your truth and allow it to be understood so that we would be shaped by your truth so that we could live for your glory. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. There's a famous poem that you might be familiar with written by the poet William Ernest Hens Henley. He lived from 1849 to 1903. 
And the name of this poem is Invictus, which is Latin for unconquered. William Henley wrote this when he was 27 years old. He had battled tuberculosis for several years and he looked to himself for strength. And in this poem, he declares his cosmic independence as he stands as one who is victorious over his trials and circumstances. This poem has been used to inspire many. It's, it's inspired the building of CrossFit gyms throughout the United States called Invictus. So there's one in San Diego that you might be familiar with. Nelson Mandela quoted and recited this poem to himself as he stood in prison, standing against the unjust system of segregation in South Africa. Timothy McVeigh, who was responsible for the death of 167 people in Oklahoma City, had this read as he received lethal injection. This is how this expression of stubborn resolve and cosmic independence reads. Henley writes, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Despite Henley's declaration of cosmic independence, the leg that he had lost because of his tuberculosis would cause him to fall from a carriage, leading his, his latent tuberculosis to flare up and he would die at the age of 53. As loudly as we might exclaim it and proclaim it, we are not the masters of our own fate. Neither are we the captains of our own soul. Though Henley's resolve was courageous, his hope was gravely misplaced. His perspective of himself was severely inflated. In God's word, we learn that there is one who is the creator of all things, who is the master of our fates, who is the captain of our souls. God's word instructs us that he is the creator and rightful owner of everything. And he is the one who exercises authority over all creation and over every life that lives upon this earth. That we can't control our own fates. If we trust in him, if we look to him, we can stand with unwavering courage, not because of our own resolve, but because of the one that we trust in. John Bloom comments and writes, The incredibly good news is that in Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us, we are more than conquerors. Ours is not a stoic resolve against mindless evil. Ours is a hope-infused, courageous resolve, because come what may, the end will be glorious beyond all comparison. If Christ is the master of our fates, the captain of our souls, we have nothing to fear. We will be sustained to the end with our scroll reading guiltless all will work together for good and though we die yet shall we live today we declare that though we are not independent though we are not the captains of our own fate neither the masters of our own soul we stand because of the one that we hope in as we recognize our own poverty and inability we are directed to the treasures of christ our great and glorious king in our text today, we learn of this king, that God is a creator and owner of the universe who is worthy of all worship and all praise. He exercises his dominion over his domain, which is all of creation. In Psalm 24, David instructs us of God's authority. He tells us the requirement of those who worship this authoritative God, and he calls us to make way for the king of glory. Psalm 24, in some ways, is at the end of a series of psalms, Psalm 22, 23, and 24. I love the psalms because in them we see honest confession, genuine prayer, 
and praise that flows out of a heart that is brought low with eyes lifted up to the glory of God. By the Spirit's inspiration, David talks in Psalm 22, 23, and 24 of his own experience. But as he does so, he points us to the great and glorious Savior that is to come. As he writes of his own experience, he looks forward to David's greatest son. That is a culmination of all these things that he describes. In Psalm 22, as David describes his own suffering, we look forward to the cross of Christ, who is the suffering servant and the conquering king. In Psalm 23, which is familiar to many of us, David writes of how God is a good shepherd and the gracious host. And he looks forward to the good shepherd that is to come. Here in Psalm 24, he describes the crown of the king of Israel. And he anticipates the coronation of the king of the universe as one day he will return. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. The context of this psalm is actually very familiar to you all because you discussed it last week. Our brother William looked at... at at uh, David as the ark was brought into Israel. And this is actually the backdrop for the psalm that we look at today. In this majestic psalm, we move in procession with the king of glory as the ark that symbolizes the presence and the guidance of God is brought back to its place in Israel and is placed inside the tabernacle. This is the most likely occasion for this psalm as the ark was finally moved by King David from the house of Abinadab and Kirjath Jerim to Mount Zion. The king over Israel would return to its rightful place. We understand the backdrop, so I won't go through it in as much detail as I had originally planned, but we understand that the Philistines had taken the ark thinking that it would bless them. And they found the head of their false god, Dagon, on the floor along with his hands. And they were afflicted with curses and, and sores. They promptly sent the ark back to Israel. As God demonstrated his superiority over the false nations of the Israel, of the, the false gods of the nations around Israel, Israel did not welcome the ark as it should have, and it was left at Abinadab's house for more than a half century through Samuel's judgeship and Saul's rule. This ark that represented the king of Israel now, as we consider the psalm, would finally return to its rightful place. The attention of Psalm 24 is rightfully on the king. And in our text today, we'll just consider how the king that we worship is the all-creating one, the all-holy one, and the all-victorious one. We'll consider in our text today three characteristics of the king of glory. Three characteristics of the king of glory. And first, we consider that we worship the all-creating one, the all-creating one. And we find that in verses 1 to 2. David writes, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. David sets the steam for this psalm by establishing the dominion of the Lord. His realm, his, his dominion, his entire earth, everything belongs to him because he made all things. Yahweh is the rightful owner and ruler of the earth because he created it. We see this in the very beginning of scripture. God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you create something, you have rightful authority over it. If I create a shoe, I decide what, what it's used for. If I... I uh, I took a ceramics class one time with Julia and I made something that slightly resembled a cup, except it was a little too wide. So I determined that it would be a bowl instead. I made it so I have the right to determine its use and its purpose. Even more than that, God created the heavens and the earth. We are a creation. He is a creator. And as much as we would like, the creation does not determine who the creator is or the limit of his authority. God is the one who has created all things. And whether we agree with it or not, he is the rightful maker and owner of the heavens and the earth. David here describes that the fullness of the earth 
belongs to him. This describes the whole earth. Every inch, if you're, if you're in the UK, every centimeter of the earth belongs to him. Every fiber of our being, every molecule on this planet was created by him and belongs to him. There is no other owner. There is no other master. H.G.M. Spence comments, Men may call themselves lords of the soil and make what laws they choose about land, but in literal truth, every inch of earth, center to surface, belongs to the blessed and only potentate. The wealthiest owner, the most absolute despot, is but a tenant at will, who may at any moment receive notice to quit. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. David continues, the world and those who dwell therein. World is synonymous with earth, but David here declares, not only does everything belong to God, but everyone who inhabits the world belongs to him. That's every one of us that is here. That's every person that is on this planet. Beloved, you belong to Yahweh. You are not your own maker or master. You belong to the one who made you and rules rightfully over your life. In verse 2, David explains why God has rightful rule over everyone and everything. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. God made everything and everything belongs to him. In Genesis 1, 9 to 13, we see, I'll read it for us. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, the fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which there is seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. God spoke, and it was so. By the word of his power, he brought everything to be. He gave the earth order and beauty. Everything and everyone exists by his sovereign and providential care. God has no competition. There is no other. These verses stand in contrast to the, the beliefs of the ancient Near East that creation arose out of a conflict between the gods of order and the gods of chaos. And the gods of order defeated the gods of chaos. But we see in scripture that there was no such conflict with God. He simply spoke and all things came to be. Brothers and sisters, this is the God that we worship. He has no competition. He is the unrivaled creator of everything and everyone. And his sovereignty cannot be challenged. As we are confronted with this reality and we are given reasons of praise in verses 1-2, we have to consider again, do we recognize the authority of God? Authority is not, is not found within those that, that recognize it, for, for lack of a better way of saying it. God is not God because we say that he is so. God is not God because we sing songs to him. God is not God because we proclaim it, write it on our profiles or proclaim it out loud or in our social media. God is God because he created the world and everything that is in it. Do we recognize his authority over this world, but also over our own lives? As Terrence caused us, called us to consider, friends, who do you live for? Whether we acknowledge it or not. If, if that little uh, cup slash plate slash bowl that I made were to speak back to me and say, I am not a cup, I am a fine a uh, jar made for beautiful flowers, not for your coins. We can only put...
if we put anything else, it would just fall out. If that if that jar if that bowl slash plate slash cup were to cry out, I am a beautiful vessel made for flowers. You are not my maker. You are a fool. Right. I would probably take that uh, not so beautiful plate slash bowl slash cup and I would throw it on the ground. Right. I made that cup bowl plate, <laughs> whatever it is. Like, it's a coin holder now. And I, I, I have rightful authority over it, whether it agrees with that or not. Even more, even as God has created all of us and everything that is in this world, even as its creation, his creation does not fail, does not recognize the authority of the creator, he remains and stands as king. But the question is, do we recognize his authority? And will we joyfully submit to who he is? Who do we live for? He has no competition. There is no other creator. There is no rightful master. So first, in this psalm, we see that we worship the all-creating one. In verses 3 to 6, we see we worship the all-holy one. We worship the all-holy one. In verses 3 to 6, David writes, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God, the God of Jacob. In verses 1 to 2, we're confronted with the reality of the God who is creator and Lord over the heavens and the earth. He has no competition. His power and his might stands unrivaled. In verses 3 to 6, we're confronted with the question, if this is God, who can rightfully go to worship him? Who can worship the one who is the creator of all things, who is infinitely holy? Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? The tone of this psalm shifts now as David considers the requirements of worship and fellowship. The one who goes to worship God must live a life that pleases him and must meet the requirements to stand on his holy hill. The hill of the Lord here refers to Mount Zion. It's a place that on earth represents God's glorious and special presence in heaven. It represents the presence and guidance of God with his people. This is where David's journey with the ark would culminate as the ark is, is placed in the tabernacle on Mount Zion. As they are given this weighty task of bringing the ark that represents God's presence to its dwelling place, David asks the weighty question, who is worthy to be brought into contact with a God of such holiness, of such might, and such glory? And we are caused to consider the same question as well. Who is worthy? David continues, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. As you considered last week in David's first attempt, he had disregarded God's holy requirements. The return of the ark had failed. Uzzah died as he touched the ark. And David responded in his heart with anger. What I love about, as we consider the life of David is that he does not always respond in the right way. But by God's grace, when he first responds poorly, he recognizes his own sinfulness. He's brought to humility and his hope is fixed upon his God. David now understands the moral qualities that are required of worshipers, that, that he has to do it God's way. God demands not sinlessness, but blamelessness, a life that seeks to honor God. At the same time, what is essential is that David understands that he does not meet these requirements. He must look to the one who does. To have clean hands is it's simply to be innocent, to be blameless, to have, to have hands or outward actions that honor God. Clean hands refer to right actions and a pure heart refers to a right attitude and will. This is an, a heart that is driven by motives that are unmixed and untainted by sinful and selfish desires. 
God doesn't just simply desire an appearance of holiness, but a heart that genuinely seeks after him. The requirements to worship God are clean hands, right action, pure heart, unmixed motives, and one who does not lift up his soul to what is false. To lift up your soul is simply to direct your soul to something, to strive after something. And here he says, this person who goes to worship God must not strive after what is false or what is futile, what is worthless and what is vain. This is to put our hope and our trust in anyone or anything other than God. As Israel recognized the false gods of the nations around them failed. These nations were, were, were demonstrated that it was demonstrated to these nations that their gods were mute. They could not hear. They could not see. They couldn't do anything at all. And they stood in contrast to the living God who is able to rule and reign over all things. But when we go to worship God, who do we worship? Who do we look to? Who do we trust in? As the last requirement, David says, one who does not swear, speak, swear deceitfully, simply said we must speak the truth. God calls for those who have a pure heart, devoted lives, and honest tongues. Brothers and sisters, are your hands clean? Is your heart pure? Does your soul strive towards God? And is your speech true? Do you lift your souls to the true and the living God or to created things that cannot satisfy? Or have you declared and made yourself to be God, making yourself the center of the world and your life? As preparations were made to worship Yahweh, the worshipers asked themselves and each other, do you qualify? Are you worthy? Can you ascend the hill and enter into his tabernacle? As these worshipers and as David honestly considered the answer to these questions, they had to say, we don't. As David considered his own heart, as he considered his actions, his heart, his soul, and his speech, he would have to say, we don't meet these requirements. I cannot ascend the hill of the Lord. I have no right to worship him. This second time as David brought the Ark of the Covenant to the tabernacle, he now understood the answer to this question. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Not I. Who can enter in to worship at his holy place? By my own strength and enablement, I am absolutely unworthy. He understood God as a creator of the heavens and the earth, the God who is holy and set apart, not only in his, his being as a creator, but in his in his morality as the one from who, whom all righteousness flows from. He is the standard of what is right and wrong. And he compares us, not according to our own standards, as we compare ourselves to those that are around us. David may have been more righteous than some of the others that were in his presence, but he was absolutely unrighteous in the presence of a holy God. Before a holy God, we fall absolutely short. As we consider an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year in our lives, we all have varying age ranges. And because of, as I look out, I cannot determine your age. I will just say we're all in the range of uh, the adult slash young adult category. But in the totality of our lives, Friends, we understand that if God judges us for sin and his standard is his own holiness and he considers not only our actions, but our thoughts and our heart, our sin against God is greater than any mountain that stands upon this earth. And by our own merits, we have no right to worship the holy and the living God. But the very one that David anticipates is the means by which he can go to worship God. The mountain of judgment demanded by our sin was placed on Christ's shoulders as he bore the wrath of God for every sin that we have committed, that we will commit. For those who trust in Christ, that wrath was paid in full on the cross by Christ. 
David anticipates this future sacrifice. He looks forward to the greatest son of David who would come to live the perfect spotless life that no man could live and to die the death demanded by sin that no temporary sacrifice could fully pay for. David understood the purpose of these sacrifices wasn't simply to kill an animal, but to represent the one who could take away the sin of the world, the one whom John the Baptist proclaimed, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is our only hope, and this, he is the only means by which we can worship God. He has clean hands and a pure heart. He meets the requirements that we can never meet. We see this attitude and understanding in the second, in the second attempt of the transportation of the Ark of the Covenant. Burnt and fellowship offerings are, 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 are offered and sacrificed for sin and as praise to God. And after the first six steps, David himself offers sacrifices. David understood that he couldn't proceed apart from God's provision of righteousness and the perfect sacrifice that these offerings were a picture of. They had no right to enter in unless God provided the means to do so. And David declares, God, I am unrighteous, but you make the provision for righteousness. My hope is not in myself or my ability, but in you. As those if, who have trusted in God's provision of righteousness, we can have clean hands and a pure heart because our hearts have been made new. Though we once had hearts that rebelled against God and hated him, he gives us a love that we never have so that we can live for him and strive after him so that our hands, our feet, our eyes, our tongues can be used as instruments for his glory. David continues in verse 5. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. A promise is given to those who meet these requirements by God's provision and enablement. And the promise is that he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The emphasis, emphasis sorry, not the, em, the impetus and the emphasis of verse 5 is on what God gives. God gives blessing, righteousness, and salvation. This makes it clear that it isn't the worshiper who is worthy of these things, but it is a gift that is given by God. And David declares an assurance of divine acceptance. Those who come to Yahweh with a pure heart, who come to worship him, who desire to love God and to serve him, God promises blessing and he promises righteousness. Again, David understands that this righteousness is a gift given by the God of salvation. He understands that the festivals and the feasts, the sacrifices and the offerings that are instructed to Israel, that they practice, look forward to reconciliation that was to come, forgiveness that would come through him. David's greatest son would be a king, a prophet, a high priest, and a sacrifice that would enable us to be reconciled to the holy God that we have sinned against. He continues, such is a generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. Those that have been declared righteous, who are given new hearts, this is the generation of those who seek him. A generation describes broadly just a group of people. These are those that seek God's face, who desire to be in his presence, who long to go to God, to worship him. To seek God is to simply desire to live before him, to fellowship with him, and to live according to his standards. It often describes those who go to the temple to worship God. And these, this group of individuals long to be in the presence of God. In the Masoretic text, it says, your, who, who long to seek your face, O God of Jacob. Um, 
but the Septuagint, or the, um, my apologies, the, the Masoretic, the Septuagint and several manuscripts have the addition of God of before Jacob, God of Jacob. But in the Masoretic text, it simply says, your face, comma, Jacob. It's very confusing in the English. Uh, Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Jacob. What we do understand is Jacob is, is given as an example of those who seek after God. Jacob is given, out of all the patriarchs, Jacob is given as an example of those who seek God's face. But the question is, why Jacob? As we consider the patriarchs, there are so many that were better. What about Abraham? Abraham represents faith. He believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Isaac, Abraham's son, even lived and experienced God's blessing upon his life. He gives us a picture of substitution as Abraham offered Isaac and a substitution was given in his place. Jacob is given as an example of those who worship God because he is a picture of God's unmerited election, his unmerited election. Jacob is one who did not deserve God's love or affection, but who God determined to set his love upon. As we consider Jacob's life, he tricked his brother Esau out of his birthright. Then he deceived and lied to his father for blessing. Even at the end of his life, Jacob told Pharaoh when he was reunited with his son, Joseph. In Genesis 47, 9, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. Jacob understood that he was not worthy. Jacob's posture was humble because of the life that he lived. But God set his love upon him. And in Romans 9, 11, it says, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Jacob was not qualified, but God set his love and affection on him by his divine and unmerited grace. Those that go to worship God do so, not because we are worthy. We are unworthy. Our hands are unclean. Our hearts are not pure. But we look to the one whose hands are clean. We look to the one who has lived the life that we can never live, who died, who rose, who stands as our hope and our glorious king. At the end of this verse, as of this verse, David pauses. Selah, a break as a procession, pauses before it advances. So we worship the all-creating one. We worship the all holy one and lastly we worship the all victorious one the all victorious one and we see that in verses 7 to 10 the psalm culminates in these verses as yahweh's arrival is greatly celebrated as the ark arrives to jerusalem to zion to be placed in tabernacle these verses give us a picture of the celebration As you might have learned last week, Jerusalem had once been a Jebusite city before David conquered it, and now he reigns over Judah and Israel over from that city. But David understands that though he is the king of Israel, he is only a lesser king. The true God of Israel is not David. It was not Saul. It's Yahweh who is the king of glory. He is the most powerful, awesome, and worthy king of the universe and over the nation of Israel. And after more than 60 years, the ark that represents his guidance and his presence would be returned to its rightful place. And this time it would be according to God's requirements, depending on God's righteousness. Sacrifices were offered. Levites from the Kohathite division carried the ark on poles and not on a cart. And the, the ark was brought up with great joy and shouts of ex- excitement. And verses 7 to 11 describe the great celebration. And it does so in terms that resemble uh, the movie Beauty and the Beast. I'm not going to sing, but I'm sure the song might be playing in some of your heads as candles have eyes and cups have noses and ears. 
They're personified. And so are the gates, the city gates of Israel as the celebration of the king continues. These city gates are personified as David cries out to them, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. David cries out, make way for the glorious king. The city gates of Israel were attached to walls made of stones, ooh, of stones and bricks, and the gates themselves were made of wood with bronze strips that hold them together. Over the gate, there's an arch that connects the walls. And David is saying, don't just open the doors. God is way too big for that. If God were to go into that door, he would be maybe seven feet tall. If God were to enter through those vines, oh man, rip the whole ceiling off of the, that entryway. The God that is about to enter in is so great, so mighty that no gate is tall enough for him. David says, make way for the glorious king. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, Yahweh, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. This ark that toppled Dagon and inflicted the Philistines with a plague represented the God of Israel that conquered nation after nation after nation, who rules and reigns over the entire universe. To whom every knee will and every will every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. The one entering in is the all victorious one. And David cries out, Make way for this great and glorious king. He says it again in verses nine to ten. Make way, O Israel, for the king. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. Yahweh Saboth, the God of armies, the God of battles. He is the king of glory. He is the one who exercises authority and command over the armies of Israel, the heavenly beings, the stars and the constellations, the solar system, every planet, every molecule, every fiber of this universe. God is king over it all, and he has no competition. He has no rival. And David declares, O Israel, prepare to worship this great and glorious king friends beloved we have the joy and privilege of worshiping this great and glorious king though many are unaware of his glory his splendor and his worth his worth as we are confronted with the truth of who he is and the reality of our own our own unworthiness we are presented with the hope of a savior that has lived the life that we will never live and yet has died the death demanded by our sin, by his own volition, by his own will, because of his love for us, who rose from the dead, who stands now at the right hand of the Father, and he will return to rule and to reign. And how we long for the coronation of this great king. As festive and as wonderful as this celebration was, the coronation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will be even greater. And yet there are some who recognize the King and there are some who fail to do so. According to Jewish tradition, this psalm, Psalm 24, is typically read on the first day of the week in celebration of the first day of creation. On Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the people shouted, Hosanna, and blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And the priests that were in the temple who failed to recognize the authority of Christ. They recited Psalm 24 as Jesus himself entered in, and they said, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may enter in. As, as the city asked and considered, Who is this? The priests in the temples were chanting, Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Though they did not recognize that the king of glory had 
come to establish his kingdom. This kingdom that will one day be consummated was inaugurated as Christ entered in. He came the first time as a suffering servant who would establish his rule first in our hearts. He will return as a conquering king who will rightfully rule and reign over the creation that was made through him and for him. As we study the, tr the, the return of the king and the triumphant return of the Ark of Jerusalem, Professor Scott Pashore notes, we have no sacred furniture, but we look to something even greater, to the victories of David's greatest son, King Jesus, who is Lord of battles. He has won the battle against sin and death and hell, and he has ascended in glory in heaven, and he is enthroned there. And we look forward to the return of our glorious king. His glory will be on full display, and there will be no overturning of that king. Beloved friends, we have the opportunity to join in the worship of this great and glorious king. As we recognize our inability and our lack of worth, that puts us in a good place. As we recognize our own sin and how greatly we rebelled against God, as we see that even our hearts fail to worship God as it ought to, our affections often are placed in objects that are unworthy of our adoration. We are brought to our knees as David was, and we recognize that we have no hope in and of ourselves, but there is one who is our hope. And though David looked forward to that king, we look to him. He stands as a king, as a conquering lion whose hands are pierced because he bore the weight of our sin. The question is, will we look to him? Will we turn to him? Will we trust in him? In humility, will we recognize the gravity of our sin and our inability? Will we be brought down low so that our eyes will be fixed upon the one who is the only object of our hope, who is worthy of all praise and all adoration? In the 20th century, Dorothy Day responded to William Henley's poem, Unconquered Invictus, with a poem she titled, Conquered, describing our humble dependence on the conquering king of glory. She writes, out of the light that dazzles me, bright as a sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be for Christ, the conqueror of my soul. Since his sway, his the sway of circumstance, I would not wince nor cry aloud. Under the rule which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears that life with him and his in his the aid that spite the menace of the years keeps and will keep me unafraid i have no fear though straight the gate he cleared from punishment the sc the scroll christ the master of my fate christ the captain of my soul humanity's great desire is to declare independence from the god that has made it but just as a plate, bowl, cup that I made has no right to choose who its creator is, God is a creator of the heavens and the earth. What many are unaware of is that we are filled with joy as we recognize that we are not independent, that we are not the creator, but the creation. From the very beginning, Satan's lie is that the creator of the heavens and the earth seeks not our gain, but his own. God does pursue his own gain and his glory because he is worthy of it. But from the very beginning, God's intention for his creation is that we would know how great... The intention of our Creator is that we would know how great and how good 
he is. Beloved, the lie that creation has and continues to fall for, that we often fall for today, is that God does not desire our good. We remember that Satan challenged Eve and asked, does God really have your good in mind? He doesn't want you to have these things. God has not forbidden you because he loves you, but because he's withholding from you and keeping you from whom you can truly be. His lie was a similar one that the poem Invictus holds to. But in fact, the reality is that God made us so that we can recognize how good and how glorious he is, so that as we trust in him, we can entrust ourselves to the care of a God who is not only all-powerful, who is not only the rightful ruler who exercises authority over all of creation. He is worthy of praise and he loves us. His commands, his promises for us are for our greatest good and for our greatest joy so that creation could worship the creator that made it, enjoying the good things that he has given us as we look to the creator and giver of those good and perfect things. So beloved, will you join in the worship of the king as we worship the one who is the all creating one, the all holy one, and the all victorious one. Let's pray together. Father, our eyes are often muddied by sin. As David was, even as he once pursued you and was after your own heart, the deceitfulness of sin had also blinded him from the greatness of your glory. But would you enable us to behold you with eyes that see clearly and behold you for who you are? That we are unworthy, enable us to trust not in ourselves, but in you. Lord, you are our hope, you are our righteousness, and though we are weak and destitute, our hope is not in ourselves, but in you. We rejoice that you have washed those who have trusted in you and declared us clean, and you have covered us with robes of righteousness, and we continue to cling and wear that robe with all of our strength. So, Lord, help us to worship you as you are worthy of. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, church.